I discovered Bitcoin when I was reading a TechCrunch article as a sophomore in high school. To me, I didn't really understand it at first. It was confusing. Digital money, I had to send money to China to buy it. This company called Mt. Gox, you could, it was the first exchange that was selling them. And I heard a lot about the news. I heard it would go to zero. I heard it had no value. I heard that it was bad for the environment. But at the end of the day, I was curious. And so I kept looking into Bitcoin. And for me, Bitcoin is the truest form of money. What I mean by that, it's the fairest. It's the, it's a form of money that will allow society to progress uh, dramatically in the right direction, in a, in a direction that's equitable and fair for everyone. That's something that really resonated with me. I spent uh, my senior year of high school in Honduras for about, oh, well, not my senior year of high school. I spent 30 days after my senior year of high school in Honduras. And during this time, I realized that I had an amazing opportunity being uh, born in the United States and not, not, and that, and that everyone else and that not everyone had the same opportunity as myself because they didn't have access to the U S dollar. And that, at that point I realized how important and how grateful I was to be in the U S during the dollars, you know, dollar reign of the world and being the world's reserve currency. Historically, every hundred years, uh, we have a, a currency flip. And so if you look back in the history, you can see every hundred years that we have a new currency that usually is used for trade all across the world. And the problem today with the currencies we have is they don't actually reflect the value of work that's happening in the real world. So because of the financialization of assets and of different um, products and commodities, they've been great to help ex expand and globalize the world, creating massive opportunities for real estate and energy companies. But the problem is, is that the banking sector on a percentage basis is becoming more and more uh, worth more and more than the actual real value that's being created. And so at some point, well, what is happening today is that the value of that dollar is becoming less and less. When we have these massive stimulus bill, um, we print more money. We, we printed more money in 2020 and 2021 than we did for all the years combined of the existence of the United States. And that means the dollar in your pocket is worth less. Sadly, creating money isn't free. And when they create money, what happens is the asset prices go up. So people that own assets or the rich are the ones who continue to gain wealth. While people who are working normal day-to-day -day jobs are never able to get out of, this, out of the system. And so for me, I realized that fundamentally the only thing I cared about or the, one of the only things that I really appreciated was my time. And I feel like most people would agree with me on that. And I was like, I want to preserve my time. I want to be able to do what I would desire with my time. I don't want to have to sit in school and, and spend my time here. And at the time I was, you know, sophomore, junior high school, I still completed high school, but I decided that I wanted to spend my time doing what I loved, which was traveling, working on computers, exploring. And the ability for me to do that, like everyone else, I had to pay my bills. I had to live in a house. And so I had to find a, a monetary system that would work for me and not against me. Most people don't think about the underlying cash they use in the pocket. They think the dollar is the only option. And that's what I'm going to use. But we're coming up to where we are here today in a, in a place where you can make a decision to use bitcoins instead of dollars in your day to day life. Now, I'm not saying completely remove dollars and not and spend money. And stop using your credit card. No, it's important that you use that. But I'm saying storing your wealth. Don't store your wealth in dollars. It doesn't make sense to have five thousand, ten thousand dollars in your bank account. It makes much more sense, in my opinion, to hold that in a strong asset like Bitcoin. Bitcoins, there'll never be more than 21 million of them. You don't know how many dollars are going to be in a year. You don't know how many dollars are going to be in 10 years. You don't know the worth of that dollar. The same thing could be said about Bitcoin. We don't know what Bitcoin's going to be worth in 10 years, but I can tell you something. A scarce digital asset that is, that is worldwide and people all over the world can buy it and is becoming accessible to institutions across the world will continue to rise in value because of the nature of how it's designed. Bitcoin is hard to get. It's built and protected by miners like myself who protect the Bitcoin network and who allow us to trust that the network is truth and accurate, that every transaction is not counterfeit, that it wasn't spent somewhere else, and that those coins are what we call you know, legit coins or not coins that didn't get double spent. 
So that's why I got into Bitcoin is because I wanted to preserve my time. And Bitcoin is the best way for anyone to preserve their future time that you could be spending with your children, you could be spending with your wife or your husband, and then you could be spending with yourself on vacation, enjoying a beach. That's why I bought Bitcoin. And that's why I continue to buy $300 in Bitcoin every day. That's why I continue to run this mining facility and grow and share my vision. And that's why I continue to produce content is because I would love to share the message and the opportunity and the freedoms that Bitcoin has allowed me to experience over the past 10 years of my life. And I hope that you continue to research it. It is very complicated, but it is very simple. Bitcoin at the end of the day, there's 21 million of them. It's backed by energy and it'll never go away. A Bitcoin is a piece of digital real estate. There's only 21 million Bitcoins and you're like buying a little portion of that land. So Bitcoin is a bit, the ability to scale trust because the internet allowed us to scale information. We could now communicate ideas like this one across the world without any barriers. But to trust someone or to trust an, inst an institution or a company, we had, to, we, we had to trust a company or an institution to send money across borders because we couldn't actually physically deliver the money to that person. And so with Bitcoin, it allows us to trust the network. And that network is secured by Bitcoin miners. Now, as I mentioned, there's only 21 million Bitcoins. And so the way to look at it is that there's 21 million puzzle pieces. And each one of these puzzle pieces comes out through the Bitcoin network through a process called mining. So the miners are basically doing math puzzles to find these puzzle pieces. And every 10 minutes on average, new Bitcoins or new puzzle pieces are given to the miners who solve the problem. Now, the problem is just a big math equation. And all the computers do is they do something called a hash function where they calculate what the above, they basically calculate the math problem. And if it gets above the block height or the block difficulty, they're able to capture new puzzle pieces or new Bitcoin. And the block difficulty or the block height is set by the Bitcoin network. The block difficulty is set by the Bitcoin network every two weeks. So every two weeks, if more Bitcoin miners join and it gets harder, It'll readjust, it'll make the block difficulty harder, and that puzzle now became X amount harder. And then that means the miners have to work even that much harder to get the same amount of Bitcoins because more people join. But if Bitcoin prices crash or when the halving event happens, that puzzle becomes easier. That's because people turned off their puzzle solvers, their Bitcoin miners, and they let the then they turned them off and so that's why it becomes easier and so what happens is, is you have this equilibrium of people who have higher cost power turning off their puzzle finders first people with lower cost power able to keep up and keep doing the puzzle solving as as long as they have the ability to be profitable now each machine generates something called a tera hash that's what i mean by hash rate hash function a tera hash is a unit of measurement for computers it's like a miles per hour for cars. So each computer, as I mentioned, my jalapeno miner was five giga hashes. So a tera hash is a thousand giga hashes. And the new computers run at 95 tera hashes up to potentially even 110 tera hashes, depending on which model you get. And those computers send that hash function. Think about that as like the speed they solve the puzzle to the Bitcoin network or to a Bitcoin pool. And then the, the network or the pool is what gets paid out based on the hash function um, being above the Bitcoin difficulty. So if their hash function it solves the puzzle and it's above the difficulty, they, we create something called a block. And the Bitcoin block includes all the transactions that happened over the past 10 minutes and it gets added to the blockchain. Now, Bitcoin is a blockchain. And what is a blockchain? It is a collection of blocks that everyone agrees on that these transactions happened and it builds on top of each other. So the longer the blockchain, the more secure it is. And the farther your block is in the blockchain, the more secure it is and the less likely it is for someone to overwrite that. And so to recap, we have Bitcoin miners that generate hash functions and they create something called hash rate. Normally, Bitcoin miners today generate 95 to 110 tera hashes of hash rate. That hash rate pays close to 30 cents to 40 cents per in US dollars per tera hash per day, which is about 
33 bucks a day on a 95 terahash machine. The only cost to run these machines is the energy, the labor, and the infrastructure supporting it. That infrastructure could be containers, buildings, ethernet cables, power cords, the labor are technicians, employees, accounting, overhead, and the biggest cost is energy. And so the terahash has to pay for all three of those expenses. And because energy at two cents is half off energy at four cents, and energy at eight cents is four times more expensive than energy at two cents. Since energy is the biggest cost, Bitcoin miners have to ensure they have the lowest cost power. And that's how they're able to remain competitive and continue to run their operations.